to gather together here. Holy Spirit, you are the great teacher. We honor you in this place as that. We surrender what we know to gain Christ. Open the eyes of our understanding. Bring to us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of who you are, who Jesus is in us. Father, I thank you for the new covenant that we can be set free from death, from the fear of death. So we're not held in bondage. That we can stand fast in the liberty in which you have made us free. May we live in that liberty. In the midst of adversity, may we live in liberty. In the midst of persecution, may our hearts be fixed on peace. And no matter how distant things are, may hope be our motivation. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. Be our guide. We surrender to you for transformation through revelation. And all God's people said? Amen. 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 Just real quick, I'm going to pick up on the word that was just given at the end there about witchcraft. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, and it's not so much those that are performing the witchcraft, which uh, you need to understand witchcrafts, you know, it, it really is, and we're going to talk about this, but it, it's not the words that are said, or it's not the scripture in the words that is said. It's the imagination you attach to the words that are said in scripture. When you hear witchcraft, what do you think? I mean, do you see someone a hat like this and grab it, you know? No, 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 no. no. Witchcraft is manipulation of uh, someone else. It's taking control of someone. It's actually murder a little at a time. Yeah, that would be true. Uh, it's actually murder. A you're, you're, you're killing someone a little at a time when you control and manipulate them. Killing me softly. <laughs> and, and, and so and, and I, I love what it says here in Galatians chapter 3 verse 1 oh foolish he's speaking to the church people he's not talking outside the church and the covens and all the stuff that's going on he's speaking to in the church he says oh foolish Galatians who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was also clearly portrayed among you as what? crucified this only I want to learn from you did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith are you so foolish having begun in the spirit are you now being made perfect by the flesh or you might want to say by the law I tell you what see see when you start doing things according to the flesh you're going to be able to be manipulated in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 and 15. Let me do that. Put that one on the board real quick, Joy. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Now watch this. And release those. Say release. Release. That means they've been in bondage. And release those who through fear of death, see if they had a fear of death, they were in bondage. Mm -hmm. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Mm -hmm. See, if you're afraid of dying and you're afraid of death, you are going to be able to be manipulated by someone in authority. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. true. Instead of being controlled or, or moved by the Word of God, you're going to be controlled and moved by some form of manipulation, which is witchcraft, and it's rampant in the church. It was rampant in the church in Galatians. And it's rampant in the church now, controlling and manipulating people for things of the flesh instead of being things of the Spirit. And we think we got to fall in line with the flesh. And it says, how, how, how can we be so deceived to think that we started something in the Spirit that now we can be matured by now accomplishing it in the flesh. Man, that's witchcraft, people. So it doesn't have to be a coven or someone doing chants or, you know, toil and trouble, whatever, they, you know, toil and bubbles, you know. How about fear of COVID? 
<laughs> fear of COVID. <laughs> well, what, what, what are you feared of COVID, death? Yeah. Fear of any kind. Yeah. Fear is not one of your. It's not one of the kingdom of heaven principles. The kingdom of heaven is made up of what? Righteousness, peace, peace. and joy yeah. in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Fear's not mentioned in that. If you're moved by fear, you're not being moved by the Word of God. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be straightforward and blunt. If you're afraid of something that the world has to offer, you're under a form of witchcraft. You're surrendering to it. And we wonder why we're not walking in the blessings. Okay, we won't meddle anymore in that. All right, let's go up. Uh, we're going to talk about several things t uh, tonight, and uh, I, I really, it's, I was sharing with Brad, it's very hard, it's very hard to focus on tonight when we're thinking about two weeks from that tonight, uh, on that Saturday, uh, April the 3rd. Uh, how many people have been here for, for a gate to gate teaching before? Amen. Raise your hand. That's awesome. That's it. No, what? It, how many people have been here to, to a gate and gate teaching before? One, two, three, four. No one else has been to a gate. You were here. <laughs> he was raising his oh, hand. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> wow, wow. I think so. I, I I tell you what, if there it is one of the most amazing for me, I'm still astonished every year. The Holy Spirit just goes. Uh, this started probably twelve years ago. We are uh, actually. Well, 15 years ago, we had the first revelation of this, and God had me hold this message. Where's Deb Bess? Okay. God, I, we got this revelation in Longview, Texas, and for three years, God wouldn't let me speak it anywhere. And I knew the first church I was going to speak this at, and it was a church called, at that time, Grace Chapel in Willis, Texas. Where you were, Deb. And that's where the church you were at, and... When we shared this this message in Willis, Texas, at Grace, it just exploded. Uh, we had a very what I at that time very limited amount of knowledge in this area, and it just was like kaboom. The worship team was I mean can't explain the service. And every year, God has just been bringing more and more information over the last eleven years. Uh, every year, we get new information to give you an idea of what we're talking about. Uh, I think Brad used this as a commercial last time or whenever it was. Uh, you know, when, when, when the priest, what we do is bring all the, a lot of information comes out of the Talmud and the Mishnah. And these are other books other than the Bible that the Jewish people have on how to perform their ceremonies. And when the priest takes the Passover lamb and cuts the throat of the Passover lamb, this is what he says. It is finished. Now at the exact same time, I, there are some of us who believe that the exact same moment the priest said it is finished, Jesus was hanging on the cross saying it is finished. At the, if you had a side by side split screen, it happened mouth moving at the same time. And we go through as much as we know and share everything we know about it's gone all the way back. I mean, it's getting so large now, the information where Jesus is our Passover lamb. One of the things that we, we've learned recently, I think last year, was that when, when the priest cuts the throat of the Passover lamb and says it is finished, there's a, a priest on top of the temple with a shofar. And the shofar, everybody know what a shofar is? Yep. The shofar is the trumpet or the horn that is, is sounded. And the shofar represents, if you don't know this, the shofar represents the voice of God on earth. Whenever someone heard, uh, when Moses was being uh, God was speaking to Moses, everybody heard a trumpet or a thunderings. And so it's always tied in with the, the voice of God. And Is it always a trumpet because it's the loudest instrument? No, it's just because that's just what God chose to use, and it's really a funny looking. It's not really a trumpet; it's I a know. horn. I have a trumpet. Yeah, and it's a, actually a curly horn like this. And when the priest cuts the throat, uh, and he says it is finished, there's a priest on top of the temple with a shofar. That's a little shofar. Real little. <laughs> little, little one. Real little. And he blows the Can shofar. And the Jew now listen to this, the Jewish people 
<laughs> when, when they hear that, what it's telling them is that that's God saying on earth, I've accepted the sacrifice for your sin. Okay? That's what the Jewish people, when they hear that, oh, then they celebrate that, oh, our sins have been accepted by God. The last thing Jesus would have heard before He gave up the Spirit, He said, it is finished. And He would have heard the, the shofar being sounded from the t top of the temple. He would have heard the voice of God in the sound of the, tr of the shofar yeah. saying, your sacrifice is enough for all. Wow. It That's is good. finished. Oh. That would have been the last thing on earth he would have heard before he... The sound of his father saying, it is enough. I receive your sacrifice. Wow. Well, isn't that something? Wow. And we go through all the things. You know, like the, the Jewish people, uh, you know, it, uh, this all started with asking the question, why did the priest come out and, and tell the disciples to be quiet? And that's in two weeks. And that's in two weeks. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> ah, she's keeping you on track. It was a rabbi trail. That's a good rabbi trail. Well, just, just a, well, just to shorten up, when, when, when Jesus said, if my disciples were to be quiet, the stones would cry out. You know that? He, you know, we, we, as Americans, we think gravel stones, gravel road. No, he was in the middle of a cemetery. He's talking about the gravestones. The gravestones would have, the, the, the saints of old would have cried out from the graves. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So we talk about all those other things on in two weeks. <laughs> It'll take some time, but it's all good. Hallelujah. When do you guys want our RSVP? When do you want to know if we're coming? Just Let's come. just come. Just come. We'll, we'll have brisket. Bring some food. It's spring. Okay. We can sit outside. We have to. Yeah, we'll. we'll I we'll, can't wait. I haven't no, started. it's going to be good. All right. So again, tonight we're going to be talking about... Um, Several things all combined in one thing uh, with, with the concept of discipleship. Does everybody understand Jesus was a, uh, a rabbi? Yeah. Yes. You know, people say, well, how do you know he's a rabbi? Well, it says it. <laughs> you know, it's not like you can call someone a doctor if they haven't gone through the schooling and education to qualify. You understand? I mean... You don't give that honor or that title. And, and Jewish people are even more uh, more of that way. A rabbi was something... They're uh, protective of the title. See, see to be a priest, you, you only had to be uh, born into the tribe of Levi to be a priest. But to be a rabbi, you had to earn your education. You had to earn that right for that title. And so they called, Jesus was not rabbi, rabbi, rabbi. Uh, he was even referred to as master rabbi. And we're not going to get into that teaching tonight, but what we need to understand awesome. what, is that awesome. Jesus was a master rabbi, or what is known as a rabbi with samika. It means a rabbi with authority. Rabbis could only teach what they were taught, the way they were taught it. But a rabbi with samika, or a master rabbi, uh, had his own yoke and he could interpret the scripture and how to apply it or, or the law, the Torah. And uh, uh, part of the process of becoming a rabbi before you went to rabbi school, you had to go through the Bet uh, Safar. And that was a training that started at the age of six. And if you could quote the book of Leviticus as a young male Jewish boy at the age of six, and not, not quote it uh, word for word, but quote it as what is called a remez. Let, let me show you what a remez is like. Uh, fill in the blanks. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believes but have ever. Okay, that's a remez. And so if a child at six years old, which could not read, so they had to learn from the leadership of their community, whatever town they lived in. Jesus lived in Nazareth. The priest always said, what good comes out of Nazareth? You know, ah, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Huh. Okay. And so, and so at the age of six, but if you couldn't do that, you were told at the age of six, go be about your father's business. That was the words that were used. 
You're not good enough. Okay? And basically what it's saying is that you're not good enough to go any further in rabbinical training. You're not good enough to go into the Bet Safar. If you go into the Bet Safar, you graduate from it, you're going to go into the Bet Talmud. But, no, we're not going to get into that, but the, pre, see, the rabbis come and get their disciples from the Bet Safar and when they find a, a, the Bet Safar is 12 years, uh, excuse me, 6 years. So from 6 years old to 12 years old, they're in the Bet Safar and when they graduate, the rabbis come and get their disciples from the Bet Safar at 12 years old. Hmm. And they pick their disciples. When they pick their disciples, this is what they say. Come, follow me. So I shared that to help you understand what it meant when Jesus, to help you understand that Jesus being a master rabbi and people knowing he was a master rabbi, when he was walking along the beach on the Sea of Galilee, he sees four fishermen out there who are committed to their fathers. They've already been told they're not good enough. Yeah. Mm. See, they've already been told they don't qualify. They've already been X'd out of any future glory. They're just going to be about their father's business for the rest of their life. And so they've settled in. They have families. Their father, they're all about their father's business. The father's depending on them to do their fishing, to provide for the family. Jesus shows up and said, you ever wonder why they... Can you imagine if wives, if your husband came home one day and said, Hey, honey, I won't be back for a while. Well, how long? I don't know. Well, why are you leaving? I don't know. Some guy just said, Follow me. See, Jesus looked out there and saw people that religion said wasn't good enough and didn't qualify and said, Hey, come follow me. In other words, Jesus is the God of a second chance, third chance and fourth chance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You need to realize that just because the world may not say you're good enough and don't qualify doesn't mean like they were handpicked by Jesus to come follow Him. Jesus picked His disciples according to what He could do through them. Man, nah, that's powerful right there. So in the process, we're going to talk about discipleship basically tonight. And what is discipleship? These, you ever wonder how... These guys left their dad's business. They left their wives if they had wives. They left their children if they had children. And the real miracle here is they left their boat. You won't find any guy. <laughs> Roger will never. A guy, Roger get kicked out of his house. He'll leave his friend. But he's taking his boat with him. That's the true miracle about this story. They didn't take their boat. They were willing to give up what they were doing. But you've got to realize, how did Jesus evangelize them? Did Jesus say, well, I'll wait till those fishermen get down to rock bottom and then I'll then they'll turn to me? No. Jesus evangelized them by blessing them. Yeah. He, what, what, I, he, he, this is a, a, a par this is what do you want to call it? A, I'm acting it out. Parable. No, th this rabbi, is a rabbi trail. This is a rabbi trail. And that, you know, a, Jesus walks in the be beach like this, he looks out, sees the four fishermen. Hey! They're out in the boat, they go, What? <laughs> See how I did that? It says, Catch any fish? No. no. There you go. You got it. Says, Throw it on the other side. No. But we're done. We fished all night. We know about this. Do it all the other way. We're professionals. <laughs> Just do it. They threw it out there. They caught so many fish. They had to bring all the other boats in to gather up all the fish. So God showed him his. Jesus showed him his goodness to get their attention to what it really meant. To evangelize somebody. The scripture says the goodness of God will draw all men to what? Yeah. Repent. Not to fear. Not to wrath. Not hell, fire, and brimstone. <laughs> Waiting for people to get to rock bottom. But, but the blessing, the goodness of God. Man, if the world would just understand the goodness of God instead of the wrath, judgment, and don't get me started on that. Jesus didn't evangelize that way. Why do we? But here again, they left. They dropped everything. You're back in the house. Your wife is there. Hey, honey, I'm going to go follow this guy. Well, where are you going? I don't know. When are you coming back? I don't know. You going to get paid? No, I don't think so. I don't know. He never said anything. Uh, what are you going to teach? I don't know. 
But see, <laughs> you know, but but the, you know, and I've heard, I've heard, it, I've actually heard it taught that if you're not willing to give up all that, you're not willing to be a disciple. But you got to realize that God blessed the family and the business with so much wealth, and for for a family to have a rabbi, a person in rab, rabbinical training. To become a rabbi was the greatest glory of family. It's like a trophy. It's like a Catholic who has a son that's a priest. It's like a Texan whose son is playing for the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Not the Redskins? No. 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 You know, but I'm from Texas. i got to relate to my story, okay? And just not a Dallas Cowboy, but the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. They need one. Anyway, so... So, I mean, it was a great sense of pride. And so, now, what was, what was Peter's first words out of his mouth when he got, uh, Jesus got their attention? But, Master. Why did he call him Master? master. He's a master, master rabbi. He had been in his house, healed his mother-in-law, but he knew that he was a rabbi of, of the of Samika level. And so, he said, come follow me. So these people that never that gave up having a chance of ever becoming the best of the best of the best are to become a rabbi. Man, they had another opportunity set before them because what Jesus saw in them, not what the world saw, saw in them. Yeah. And so what's it mean to be a rabbi? Or I guess the question is, who's your rabbi? Mm -hmm. What's it mean to be a disciple of a rabbi? Oh, well, real simply, a disciple literally is learning how the rabbi does it, learning what and how the rabbi thinks about things. So you can do it. Jesus said it this way, take my yoke and learn of me. Learn of me. In other words, a yoke is not a... Uh, you ever heard the analogy of the oxen and the yoke is what goes around? That has nothing to do with this. Forget all those American analogies of auction and yoke and pulling the plow and the older yokes and teaching the younger auction how to work. Has nothing to do with work. Listen to what he says. As my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come follow me. See how I do it. Take a rest. Mm -hmm. What? Because the yoke is what the rabbis would wear around their neck to identify their uh, their. Their types of uh, uh, the type of rabbi they were and what they taught. You know, in in, in graduation in colleges and in high schools, you'll see people that have doctorates and things. They have the robes on and they'll have a colored sash around their head. That's called their around their neck. It's called the yoke. Same type of thing, but rabbis carry that. And Jesus said, "Hey, this is my yoke. Don't wear those. Come. Are you tired, weary, burnt out? On go go up uh, one verse." Do you want the message? That you, were you got the message? Yeah. Yeah, go, we'll go to the message real quick. Are you tired, worn out, burned on religion? Come to me. Get away with me. That's, that, get away, say get away with me. Get away with me. Man. That is so... We're talking about that tonight. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the un... I love this. The unforced rhythms of grace. You can't say that about the law, people. The law is anything but unforced. Man. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me. We're going to talk about that tonight. And you'll learn to live what? Freely. Stand fast in what? The liberty in which Christ has made us free. Oh, but foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Once you're in the Spirit, now you're back under the law. Oh, church. Have we been bewitched? Yeah. Religion has bewitched us. Because we're not living freely and lightly. We're not living in the unforced rhythms of grace. People leave the church because they can't live up to the requirements of that religion. 
In fact, we're going to talk about some of that religion. We're going to talk. We've been having several nights uh, uh, teaching on prayer at uh, David and Shigichu's, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. But there's, I've written down what I some of the the, the spiritual tools that uh, the Word gives us. See, a discipleship has to, a disciple has to learn has to put himself under restraints. A disciple just can't do what he wants to do. Uh, an ambassador. Do you realize an ambassador of a nation can't speak his own opinion? He can only say what the country says for him to say. So he doesn't have the right to say, well, I don't think that's good, but my president says... No, he can't do that. He's speaking for... So a disciple is the same thing. You can't speak. You've got to give up your opinion. The first thing you've got to do is give up your opinion as being a disciple. How many disciples we have in here of Jesus? Opinions. Then you've got to give up your opinion. Let, let, let me show you how this works. The first four disciples were what? In, uh, occupation wise? Fishermen. Fishermen. Where at? Galilee. Galilee. Sea of Galilee. Who was the fifth tax, disciple? Tax collector. Yeah. Tax collector. Yes. Where was he collecting taxes? From the, the fishermen. On the Sea of Galilee from those fishermen. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, he's got it on the front row. Do you think they had problems with one another? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. They didn't like Matthew much. <laughs> Just think about it. Ah, yeah, we're we're disciples of this master rabbi. Yeah, let's go. What? Him too? <laughs> uh, what? He can't be a disciple. He's a tax collector. He's not one of us. No, he cheated me. Yeah. So what, uh, that, that means to be a disciple, you have to get past your issues with others. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. Do you think they had to forgive? <laughs> yeah, 490 times. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness gracious. So being a disciple, you know, it's one thing to raise your hand, but are you willing to give up your opinion? Are you willing to deal with your issues? Hmm. Another little story real quick. Jesus was going, wanted to go here, and they were down here. And to get here, they had to go through Samaria. a town called Samaria. Well, Jews and Samarians didn't, didn't get along. Actually, the Samarians wanted to get along with the Jews, but the Jews figured, thought that the Samaritans were garbage. And the disciples were all what? Jews. And instead of going around Samaria to get to Jerusalem... Jesus went right through Samaria to, to get to Jerusalem and stopped at a well. Long story short, you know the story about the woman at the well, right? And Jesus didn't have a bucket, or did he? She was his bucket. He put his water into her. She went into town with the water of the gospel of Jesus Christ, told the men in the city, and the, all Samaritan, say Samaritan, all Samaritan men, about this guy at the well. She goes, I met a man. I bet they went, I bet you did, you know, because <laughs> she had a problem, you know what I'm saying? And they said, no, no, he told me everything. And so they wanted to come see, sorry about that. <laughs> they wanted to come see this man that, see, Jesus used her for his bucket to get his well, his water, to use her as a, a missionary. Someone that wasn't qualified, someone that couldn't, wasn't good enough to, to draw water at the same time everybody else drew water in the morning. She had to go in the afternoon when there was no one else there. And God, Jesus used her to get the message of Him to the men. And the men came out. Now watch this. As they were coming to the well to see Jesus, the, the disciples were coming back with Jesus' happy meal because he had been. they said He was hungry and they went somewhere to get Him a meal. And and. He, he wasn't hungry when he got there and says, well, did someone feed him or something? And Jesus tells the disciples, this is a real quick story, okay? I'm doing real fast here. <laughs> Jesus tells his disciples, can you see? Okay, here's Jesus. Here's the disciples. Jesus sitting down. They're looking down. And Samaria is over there and the men are coming from Samaria. And he said, look up. So what did they see when they looked up? For the harvest is ripe. And your blessing is in your harvest. So who did the Jewish disciples see coming that Jesus said, hey, there's your blessing? 
Samaritans. Samaritans. They still had to deal with their issues, didn't they? It just wasn't with the tax Jewish tax collector. It was with people of another, can we call it race? So to be a disciple, you have to get back past some issues. And they stayed there for days ministering to these men. All because of one woman that wasn't qualified, willing to be a bucket that Jesus used to get His Word to a group of men. How many people want to be a bucket? Man, I tell you what. So being a disciple is easier than just raising your hand. Because Americans, we make it sound so simple. But really, part of being a disciple is getting rid of the way you think about the world and seeing the world the way Jesus... If you're a disciple of Jesus, you need to see the world through His eyes. Yeah. And that's what we haven't... See, most disciples go to a school and they want to be right about Scripture instead of fulfilling Scripture. Can I say that again? Most religions are wanting to be right about, well, this is what it says. This is what we believe. And it's a bullet point on their bulletin. But they're not really worried about fulfilling Scripture. We say this, but we don't do this. D disciple would rather be doing, fulfilling Scripture than being right about it. That's heavy thought. Okay? And so, here's some spiritual tools that the Bible gives. If you know some others, shout them out. Uh, one is prayer. We're going to talk about that tonight. Prayer is a spiritual tool. Worship, giving, communion, thanksgiving, praise, confession, uh, what you speak. These are all things that the Bible tells us to do if we're going to be a disciple. These are things that tell us that we need to confine ourselves to it even tells us what to meditate on. Meditation is a tool that the Bible, the Word gives us for a disciple to do, to meditate on these things, what is righteous, just, pure, and holy. If there's any virtue in any of this, think on these things. You got it? So these are things, these are tools that Scripture gives us for us to bring ourselves in alignment with and practice. Say practice. practice. Do you realize that, that uh, confession is not Natural. <laughs> do, you, do you realize all these things, praying without ceasing is not natural. natural. Giving is not. Dying to yourself is what? Not natural. Putting off the old man is what? Not natural. It's very natural. But we're spiritual. You got what I'm saying? It's natural to be old man, but we're spiritual now. And we got to put off the old man and put on the what? The new man. And so these are all things, but in every one of these, I've got a list here. I've got fasting. I've got Bible study. Study to show yourself approved, to work or write the Bible and word of truth. That's a good scripture, isn't it? But what's that tell you? See, here's the difference in that scripture. All of these things that we're talking about, to, we're not going to talk about all these things, but all these things we've mentioned tonight, when religion gets a hold of them, they turn them into work instead of what God meant them to be. Just like the law, the Ten Commandments, they were never given to be a dun 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 a religion. They were meant to bring a person's heart into fellowship with God. Even in the Psalms it says God didn't desire sacrifice and a burnt offering. What? He started the thing. I know, but man took it wrong and turned it into works instead of love. Instead of a relationship. Uh, in, in, in a, over at David's, we were talking about prayer. What's the difference between having a shopping list and prayer? It's, a, it's your heart. What's the difference in, in singing a song and worship? It's the heart. What's the difference in making love and having sex? Same action? Heart. Heart. See, when you take the heart out of these, these works, study to show yourself for proof. You're not studying. You can't study enough to get God to approve you, can you? No. You're approved by Christ. So it's not saying study so hard that you think God approves you and gives you more value. No, it's saying study to show yourself that you're approved. 
Amen. that you are a worker and you can rightly divide the word of truth. Because you've got the Holy Spirit there to teach you. See, things change on this side of the covenant. On this side of Calvary in the new covenant, things are different. Such as the word judge. We're going to talk about the word judge here in a minute. So we'll just go ahead and... When you say judge, what do you see? You know, there, there, there's a scripture in talking about prayer. I mentioned this last Thursday night. And we didn't talk about the second story. It was brought up, but we didn't talk about it. There's a story in there says about a, a man that uh, had a visitor come at midnight and he didn't have any bread so he went to his neighbor's house and knocked on the door and said, Hey, I've had neighbor, uh, friends come. And by the way, that's a, uh, a, a Jewish cult. It's a, a, what do you call a, a bad thing? Uh, not a... a, a, a Omen? No. Uh, it, it's a bad... It's a no-no for you not to have food for someone to come visit when they come. No matter what time or not, it's, it's like, ooh, don't, ooh, you better have food. You know, so it's that type of degree. No matter what time a person shows up, you got to have food for them to eat. You know, and so this guy didn't have any food when his friend showed up to eat. So he went to his neighbor, banged on the door, it's at midnight. Hey, you know the story. It says, I got friends that showed up. I don't have any bread. Can I, give me some bread. What a try! Try this sometime. Oh, I'm not going to go to Bible study tonight. Why? Well, my door's locked already. That's what he said. The guy said, well, my who locked it? <laughs> he did. Who do you think has control of unlocking it? He did. But his excuse is, oh, I can't help you. My door's locked all the way uh, already. Oh, and by the way, my kids are already in bed. What's that got to do with you coming down and getting him unlocking the door and giving him spread? Nothing. And then it says, but because his persistence, he was willing... And, and, and I love this. People say this is God. Don't ever put God in this box. I don't care what you say. <laughs> you don't understand Jewish culture. This is called a parallelism. This is not saying this is the way God is and the way you're supposed to be with God. It starts out saying... Who has a friend like this? I wouldn't. He wouldn't be your friend. He wouldn't be my friend. A friend would get out of bed, unlock the door, and give you what was needed. That's a friend. And it's not about you banging on the door until God finally shows up. It's called a parallelism. And it goes on and talks about knock, and it will be what? Open. It doesn't say, knock, keep on knocking, no, 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 and be a pain in God's until he finds, okay, okay. Okay? That's not what, is that the way God is? No. This is a parallelism saying, this guy, don't, this is what even this guy knows that you, he needs to give you bread, and finally he'll, through persistence, he'll give it to you. But God's not like that. Knock and it will be given. You know, seek and you'll find. I mean, the, and the other story is, is uh, I think it's in uh, Luke 11. Let's go there real quick. Real quick. What it? I don't know if it's Luke 11 or where it is. Luke 18. 18 1. Luke 18 1. We'll show you how this works with being a judge. Then he spoke a parable to them that. Uh, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Saying, there was in a certain city a judge, say a judge. a judge. So what do you think of, remember I said it's not necessarily the words that you read, it's your imagination, that you, it's how you see that word. Do you understand that? It's how you see. So when you say the word judge, what picture do you see? Court. You see a judicial judge. Okay. Black robes, yeah. There was a certain city, a judge who did not, what? Fear. fear. This judge did not fear God nor regard men. Oh, there's trouble waiting now. Okay. Yeah. Now there was a widow. Say widow. Widow. Yeah. And actually, one version says that he was an evil judge. Okay. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him. She came to who? Judge. An evil. Judge. judge that did not regard men, let alone women. Much less women. 
much less women, especially widows. They're the bottom of the rung. So, uh, the city, and she came to him saying, "Get justice for get what justice for me from my adversary." And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, "Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her." least by her continual coming she weary me. Now, people he only cared about himself. Himself. People tried to bring a parallel between God and this that this is the way you're supposed to pray. Give me some kind of break. Does this sound like God? No. First of all, the word judge you're thinking judicial. You're thinking black robe. You're thinking uh, hammer and judgment and things like this. Can we talk about what the word judge mean in Hebrew? It means deliverer. Yeah. There's a book. Yeah, I don't know if you know this or not, but there's a book in the Bible called, judges. called what? Judges. And every one of those judges in the book of the Bible was not there judicially determining right and wrong. They were there as deliverers from oppression. Yeah. Everything in the Bible, judges were about deliverers from what? Oppression. 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 Because of their own choices. Tell you, you need to understand that you need to change the way you see the word judge when you read it and look at it from a Hebrew perspective. It's not talking about right or wrong. It's talking about setting people free from their oppression. Samson was a what? Judge. And he killed Philistines and set the people free from the oppression. The word salvation. I can find seven different types of salvation in Scripture. Excuse me, let me rephrase that. I can find seven different applications of the word salvation in Scripture. Uh, uh, delivered. Wait a minute. Didn't we just talk about this? Being set free from oppression? Mm -hmm. They're de delivered, protected, made whole, healed, prospered, and the list goes on. All that mean the word salvation, but when we say the word salvation in America, what do we think? Rescue. Going to heaven. Yeah. We, we, oh, well, what do you believe about? Once saved, always saved, brother. <laughs> <laughs> People ask me that question. In my mind, I don't say it out loud. I go, oh, you idiot. You idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, they don't understand what the word salvation means. They, they want to know what, about eternal security, which has nothing to do with salvation. Salvation is what you experience of the right standing you have in the realm of the Spirit on earth. Made whole, delivered. We need to understand salvation is is. It's the reality of what God has done in the Spirit manifesting on earth. You're not going to need to be healed in heaven. You're not going to need to be protected in heaven. You understand that? You're not going to need to be delivered in heaven. You're not going to need authority in heaven. There was another guy who thought he had authority in heaven. <laughs> he got cast out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It didn't go good for him either. So you're not going to need authority in heaven. <laughs> Matter of fact, I, I, was, I was talking to Joy today, and I, you know, we're, if I get ever if I ever get to my notes here, it's, it got some good ones too. It's okay, we have breakfast. We have breakfast. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. It, it, the the Bible literally says, I, I got to turn to it. You got to see this. Turn to First Peter, chapter one. I don't know how this is going to fit, but we're going to go with it, right? Oh, oh I can't do that yet. Yes, I can. I know I'm sk skipping all over. We can, if this messed up, come back tomorrow morning and we'll straighten it up, all right? 
Uh, I'm going to read this one scripture and then go back. We'll talk about it again in a second. Verse 13 in chapter 1 of 1 Peter. Therefore, gird up your loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the what? Grace. Grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Wow. You will not receive the grace that the Bible talks about in your life without having the revelation of Jesus Christ in your life. Let me put it this way. The more of the revelation you have of Jesus Christ in your life and what He's done in the New Covenant, the more grace there's going to be in your life to walk it out. That grace gives you, that grace gives you more faith by grace, you've been saved through what? Grace. So there's the chain. Revelation brings you... The revelation of Jesus will bring you grace. That grace will cause you to walk in faith and stand in more grace. And that will bring you more revelation. And it goes as a cycle that continues to go on. The older you get, the less you should pray, for, pray about you for. The less you, your prayer life should change. The, the, the more revelation... We want to have more faith. You're not going to have more faith without more grace. You want more grace... Start praying for revelation of the Word of God in your life. Because it's going to come. That's how grace comes. Is by the re if, if righteousness is not revealed to you through Jesus Christ, there's another verse like that, you'll work for righteousness. I know people, we teach on grace all the time, and it says, well, what do I got to do to get it? <laughs> can't. You can't. It has to be revealed. That's why the Holy Spirit was brought to us. Man, and, and, and the and see, and let's talk about prayer again, real quick. We're going to focus just a little bit on prayer. Out of all these different tools that uh, you know, giving is about the heart. Communion is about the heart. Worship is about the heart. Thanksgiving praise is about the heart. Everything about being a disciple is about the what? Heart. It's about the heart. If you don't have heart, you're going to have what works? Religion. Jesus didn't come to get people to stop sinning. He came to heal the brokenhearted so they can express their love. He can express his love inside their heart and they can hold on to it so they can live out of it in the world. Now what we need to understand is that prayer is one of the things first probably the easiest thing there is to misuse. Prayer was never meant. How many people have ever tried praying for an hour every day? You know, you, you get that prayer thing. Well, can you not tarry with me but an hour? He didn't. He didn't say that to establish a doctrine or a religious standard of praying for an hour. Well, what if you only prayed fifty nine minutes? Short. <laughs> Your prayer's no good. Give me some kind of stupid break. You know, I would... So what if... You, see, Jesus even said, don't have long, wordy prayers. But prayer was never meant for you to throw up a shopping list. It was there for you to connect with God. If you got something to say, He wants to hear it. If, if, if He has something to say, you should want to hear it. Amen. Prayer is about hearing. It's communing with... What's communion? Communion is communing with... What's worship? It's communing with the Father. What's thanksgiving? What's giving? It's all about an opportunity for a disciple to get out of his old world and into God's world and commune with Him all the time. Jesus said, follow me. See, Jesus was always praying. Why? He wanted to be communing with the Father. What's fasting about? I... <laughs> If you take... I, it, it's, I, 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 it, it, okay, I may be playing with words. I don't know. Yeah, what? Tell us. The power of prayer. Come on. Oh, this is on Facebook. I'm going to hear it already. There's no power in prayer, people. The power's in the relationship mm -hmm. that you have when you pray. Mm -hmm. It's not in the action or the work of prayer. Mm -hmm. It's in the relationship. Mm -hmm. There's no power in a song service. 
There's power in the relationship when you open your mouth and sing glory to God. Mm -hmm. It changes you. The word is called repentance. Do you realize repentance? I know this is going to... Someone, someone in Facebook, they need to hear this. Repenting doesn't move God. It moves you. Mm. It doesn't do God. He's already forgiven you. Repenting, repenting is you changing your mind about you. And seeing yourself the way God sees you. That you are good enough to be one of His disciples. He has given you a second chance. He's given you a do-over, a mulligan. <laughs> Man, being a disciple. And, this, this, and it's not about having everything go your way. Man, this goes all the way back. Look, look at, well, if, you, if you have your Bibles open, leave, leave it there in 1 Peter. Look at the book of Hebrews. Chapter 6. I don't know why I'm bothered doing notes. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immobility of His counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things... You realize who those two immutable things are? God and Jesus. That's who this oath was made by. In which it is impossible for God to lie that we might have strong consolation. Say strong consolation. consolation. See, that's what it means to approach the throne of God boldly in the time of need. It doesn't mean arrogantly. It doesn't mean confident in your ability. It means confident in God's ability. That's what grace is. Grace is God's ability and our inability. So you can approach the throne of grace boldly. Boldly why? Because you know God is there for you, not against you. You're one of His children. That by two immutable things which it is possible God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to what? What did they do? They fled for refuge. Things are tough, people. Do you think things are going to get tough in America? You think things are going to get tough? Listen, they're talking about Amazon's talking about taking any religious books out of their store. Then it's going to be the Bible. Number one selling book in the world because it talks about God. Watch this. Watch this. So, listen, they, they fled. These people were fleeing for refuge, right? Mm -hmm. To lay hold. See, in the circumstance of conflict and struggle, this hope we have, and let me go ahead, have fled for refuge and lay hold of the hope set before us. While they were fleeing the situation, they had hope. When, what is hope in Hebrews 11 1? That faith is the substance of things what? Hope. hope for. That word hope is a confident expectation of good things to come. Yeah. Now, all my life, I'm not going to tell you what church I went to, what denomination I went to. All my life, I heard a scripture that said, hope deferred. Makes no sense. Sense. How come you know that? <laughs> How come we know that? Because we were told that. And what side of the cross was that on? Old the old covenant. Ah, oh. <laughs> Joy, put Romans chapter five five. Maybe you haven't heard this one. Tick tock, tick tock. Now hope <laughs> does not disappoint. Was there hope on that side of the cross? Yes. Not much. But when it, when it took its time or never got there, you, you, your heart was sick. Your soul was like, because oh, it hadn't been established. But on this cross, side of the cross, hope has been what? Established. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. You're hoping in what's already been done, not what you're waiting for God to do. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. 
Was there a hope on the old covenant side of the cross? Say yes. yes. Is there a hope on the new covenant side of the cross? Oh, yeah. Say yes. Are they different? Yeah. Say yes. Because the blood touches everything. Everything in the Old Covenant has to go through the blood of Jesus Christ before you manifest it and live in it. You, and that's what's being a disciple. Most people have made us disciples under the Old Covenant. We're New Covenant believers with Old Covenant mindsets. Let me just show you how bad our mindset is. God inhabits the praises of His people. You ever heard every Sunday? Some worship service somewhere. And so we're going to praise and worship in our song service. <laughs> and God may show up. And the new covenant, God inhabits His people. You brought Him in with you. And what makes the worship service so good is you let the Jesus that's in, inside of you come out and join with Deb Bass's Jesus that, that, that she, she's freely letting out of her. And when, when enough people get around and start letting their Jesus come out and play with the buzz of Jesus, which is all the same Jesus, Jesus gets bigger. And the more people letting Jesus come out, the bigger He's exposed. And the more Jesus is exposed, the more people see His goodness. And the more people see His goodness, the more people repent and change the way they think about God. And start seeing Him as Father. Come on. Well, thank you. No, just kidding. <laughs> Boy, we're just getting started. I'm going to start getting to my notes. Uh, let me just show you this about salvation is the word. We need to change the way we see the word salvation, especially as being a disciple. Uh, look over here at Exodus. We're going to go to the very first time in Exodus chapter 3. By the way, it's 8.54. What? What time am I supposed to stop, Tim? 11. Breakfast. I'll sleep anyway. What? Oh, let me find a scripture. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. There it is. It's up there. This is the first time the concept of a deliverer, and actually the word can be translated salvation here, it says, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmaster. For I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver. deliver. Let me read it this way. So I have come down to save mm -hmm. them. The word deliver and salvation in Hebrew is the same word. <clears throat> this is what you would hear in church. Some churches. So I have come down to save them and take them to heaven. Were they going to heaven after this? <laughs> they were being saved from their taskmasters so they can live. Mm -hmm. Remember the number 10 is always the sign of something coming to an end and a new beginning. beginning. 8 is the number for new beginning, but 10 is like the document. It's the... Uh, it's uh, Abraham had 10 things. How many plagues were there? 10. 10 plagues. How many 10 commandments are there? 10. Oh, you got that. You got the sharp. One, sorry. There's only one commandment, but there's ten commandments in the one commandment. Okay. So, so, ten, so here they had, this was the end of something and the beginning of their being set free. Once they were set free, then they had the law given to it. See, they were a tribe. They were just a family group of people when they went into bondage. Just a large tribe. When they came out, they were still a tribe, but when they got the ten commandments, they were a nation. It takes a constitution, bill of rights to establish a nation. And so that's when they became a nation is when they had the law to govern how they were to live amongst each other. And so is the new beginning again, the end of just being set free to now being organized and live the way God wants them to live. So, but the whole concept here of salvation is, and in Scripture you can go through there and see, just look it up, you'll see that the word healed is the word saved. You'll see all these different words that all mean salvation. And no, 
Again, the gospel is not about us living in a certain way so we can go to heaven someday. The gospel is about us finding hell on earth and bringing heaven to it. Find those that are under oppression and bring liberty to them. Set them free. Bring salvation to them. How many of us in our life have, are being oppressed or under uh, fear or control by a taskmaster and we're not walking in the freedom that God has set us free in through Jesus Christ? We all have some kind of taskmaster. We all have some kind of some, something telling us outside of God what to do and how to be instead of what God said to do and how He said to be. Jesus said, I want you to be my disciples. It's tire, it was time that they weren't disciples of the religion anymore, of the world. He wanted them to be His disciples and learn from Him how to see the world. And if you're over there worried about Scripture but you're not willing to help a widow, remember that unjust judge? Remember, a judge was there to deliver her from her... See, that judge was an ungodly or evil judge, didn't respect men, but God's not that way. God is there to deliver her out of that. Listen to this. How many scriptures do you know, I, I know three or four of them offhand, where God is the defender of the widows? Yep. True religion is to take care of them. God loves the widows. God loves to help those that can't help themselves. And this makes it sound like a widow has got to, that has no value in the eye of a Jewish person. That, that this widow has to beg God and beg God and beg God and beg God. Oh, no, it's a parallelism. It's not saying this is the way God is. It's saying this is the way God's not. That God's not an evil judge. God has compassion on people. You understand? And this is not... So if you're praying in your prayer life that you think God is... you got to beg Him for something He's already done? Are you still praying for God to provide for you? Quit it! He's given you all the promises of God that are what? Yes and Amen. The Scripture says everything that pertains to life and Godness has already been given. Quit asking God. You know where the concept of provision came from? When the children of Israel didn't go into the promised land and they were in the wilderness and God provided daily bread. Don't get me started on the Lord's Prayer. We'll burn that cow at barbecue with a brisket. Matter of fact, that's where we got the brisket from. So come eat. Hearty. It's a fatted calf. <laughs> it's a fatted calf. So we need to understand, to show you how far back this goes, this, this is the first time that the word deliver or the concept of prayer where Jesus was coming to save His people. It wasn't to get them to go out of this world. It was to get them to live free in this world. That's God's will for us. To live free and in control. Not for us to be the, the, the one in debt, but, but for us to be the one that's being blessing those that need help. We're supposed to be the lender. Mm. Come on. I mean, we, we, look, look over here in Genesis. But, but the, the, the Bible tells you, here he had this group of people that were fleeing for refuge, but it says, lay hold of the hope. I love that word hope. It's a confident expectation of what? Good things to come. Uh, look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 10. Now, now we shared this once before, and I don't know if anybody was here. Does anybody here remember when we talked about the river coming out of Garden of Eden? Okay, good. We'll talk about it again tonight. Now a river went out from Eden to water the garden. And from there it parted and became what? Four river heads. What we need to understand is that there was a land called Eden. There's also three other lands mentioned in Scripture that were there at the same time. You know, understand it. There's four rivers and three lands, not including, actually, four lands if you include Eden. Okay? Now, a river went. See, God put the guard, there was a land called Eden, and God put a garden in Eden. You know what Eden means? Eternity. Pleasure. You're close, but way off. 
That's a positive reinforcement, but you know, <laughs> didn't want her feeling. No. Okay. Okay. It means pleasure. You know what the garden means? Protected place. Really? So there was a protected place in a land called pleasure. That's a good place. Pleasure land. And in that pleasure land, in Eden, there was a river that came up out of the ground. And as it left the Garden of Eden and flowed through Eden, when it left Eden, it split into, into how many pieces? Four. Four. Now, go back. Let me read it. Now the river went out from Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. That's the name of the river. The word Pishon literally means hope. Nice. Hope. Where's hope flowing from? Eden in the Garden of Eden. Pleasure so land. the water that is flowing from the pleasure land is flowing in a river called Pishon, which means what? Hope. hope. Okay. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah. You're not ready for this. The word Havilah means suffering. So what does this tell us? It tells us in the land of suffering, there's a river that's flowing through it called hope. Wait a minute, what's this tell us? This is telling us that it doesn't matter what you're going through if you're suffering. If you look hard enough, you'll find a river called hope. And the key is to get in the river. Where there is gold. Now, are you, you reading my notes? Okay. <laughs> the name of the first is Pashan. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havila, where there is what? Gold. This word is not, you know, everybody knows gold. This is called colloidal gold. Do you know what colloidal gold is? Look it up on YouTube. You can find the experiments. I didn't, I don't have any gold to spare. <laughs> you understand. <laughs> Colloidal gold is really the finest, purest gold that you can have that's been literally pulverized into a powder. It even says, and the gold of that land is good. And it says, and the gold of that land is what? Good. good. And it tells about the other stuff. Is it Good is literally the concept of the finest, most, it's the dustiest, finest, purest gold that there is. And colloidal gold, when it's mixed with pure water, it takes the Two little micron thingies of gold mixed in pure water would turn the water into a, a blood-colored liquid. Whoa. Wait a minute. Now you look it up on YouTube. You can find it. If you don't trust me, look it up. So if you're in a land called suffering and you're walking through that land and you're looking for refuge, what do you do? You get in an inner tube and you find the reddest river you can find. Because it's a river called Hope that's symbolized by blood red water flowing through it. Wow. And you get in the water, in the blood, and you float through the sufferings and let the current take you out of the land of suffering. The blood of Jesus. Now wait a minute. What was one of the plagues? The blood and the water. water. Weren't they going through a time of suffering? Yeah. Yeah. And God turned the water to blood. That in the midst of their suffering, here's hope. Hope's on the way. Nice. Now wait a minute. They're on the mountain. Moses is on the mountain. He brings the Ten Commandments down. They made a calf out of what? Gold. Gold. What does he do to the calf? He pulverizes it. He beats it and makes powder out of it and throws it into the water that was coming out of the rock yeah. and it turns red. That even in their suffering, there's still hope. Even in their disobedience, there's still hope. Come on, people. Think of your Bible stories. Jesus, the first miracle He did under Roman rule, oppression. Oppression from the Romans. He takes water and turns it into wine, which is yeah. red. Nice. That under the oppression of the Romans, there's still hope. Hope is on the way. When a woman is in labor, so she's given birth, and her water breaks. Is it water? Or is it water and blood? It's water and blood. It's mixed. Because in the moment of her suffering, 
Matter of fact, where did God say, what did God say that Eve was going to go through in childbearing? Because she was going to be living in the land of Havilah. She wasn't in the garden. She was outside the Garden of Eden in Havilah having suffering through childbirth. But even in the very instance of the most suffering a woman could go through in childbirth, there's blood and water because on the other side is the greatest joy of giving birth. It's a sign of hope is on the way. There's something at the end of your suffering. It's called joy and peace. Jesus hanging on the cross. The Roman takes his spear, pierces the side, and what flows out? Water and blood. Water turning to blood. The moment, the greatest moment of Jesus' suffering. Said there was hope in the midst of his suffering. He said for the joy set before you. Man. Come on, people. As a disciple, we need to understand what salvation is. Salvation is about us having hope in the midst of adversity. Seeing things the way Jesus sees them. Seeing people the way Jesus sees them. Not seeing Scripture the way the Pharisees saw them. They had to be right. They weren't worried about fulfilling it. Jesus was more concerned about fulfilling it. Oh! You healed somebody on the Sabbath. Oh! Jesus says, stupid. <laughs> if I was Jesus, I would have called him stupid. <laughs> anyway, Jesus was more concerned about fulfilling Scripture mm -hmm. than obeying the law. Come on. We need to be that way. But some of us are so worried about the law, we get manipulated into not being the disciples we're called to be. We're more worried about being right than righteous. Yes. Are looking good. Are looking good. Yeah. Are, are, are fitting into man's mold. The disciples didn't fit in. But listen, listen, listen. We need to understand what salvation is. Zacchaeus was a what? A wee little man. And a wee little man was he. And what was he? He was a tax collector. And that little man climbs what kind of tree? A sycamore tree. Why? So he could see Jesus. Do you realize that he had no hope for his sins to be paid for? It was against the Levitical law for him to go into the temple because he was a tax collector. He was sin. He was unclean. He would have had to get someone to go do it for him, which he couldn't do, to pay the price for what he's done. So he had no hope of what is known as salvation. But Jesus said, Hey, I'm coming to your house. He was so thrilled. He said, Ah! I'm going to give half of everything I have to the poor. What did Jesus say? Salvation has come this Deliverance. To this house. Deliverance. He said salvation, but just say deliverance. Deliverance has come. Wholeness has come. Healing has come. Salvation has come. Why? Because he gave stuff away? No, because the heart was changed. You can give everything you away, but if the heart's not changed, you've done nothing. You've done nothing. Man. No, what? What? No, Romans 10 9 and 10? No repentance and weeping at the altar? Can Jesus do that? Yeah, He can. You know, that Samaritan woman, I checked it out, her name, they, history says her name was Fotin, and she led her five sisters to Jesus and her two sons, and they went as missionaries to Africa, and mm. then later they were martyred. But she totally laid down her life and hope came that day. Yeah. I'm sure she was like, I'm sure she was calling out to God that day. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't even go shopping at the right time. Yeah. I mean, you know. Can't go get water. Not yeah. accepted. Yeah. And he changed everything, including yeah. everybody's lives around her. Her whole family, her whole future and country. See, we, we get this idea that 
salvation has to be a certain way in your church. If you don't come to the altar, when did Jesus ever say, come to the altar? When did Jesus ever have an altar call, people? When did the Apostle Paul ever have an altar call? Why do we have an altar call? In churches. Well, it's just our tradition. And that if you're not, if you don't come to the altar, you're not delivered, set free, made whole, prospered, healed. Wasn't that Billy Sunday that it, it did the first one because it was such a big crowd? He, he had an altar call. Didn't know, didn't know what else to do. You know, there's a story where there was a lady that... that uh, came and washed Jesus' feet, that she was full of sin. Some people call her a harlot. I don't. If you know anything about Mary Magdalene, she wasn't a harlot. Well, she was, but she wasn't. Not of her own choosing. She was a trafficked woman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but, but literally, a trafficked woman is correct. You know what her last name is? name of a town. It's the name of a town. Her name, last name is not Magdalene. Jesus of... Nazareth. Mary of Magdala. She was from a town called Magdala. She was a Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. You, you know what happened in the, the city of uh, Magdala, uh, Magdala during the first century Rome? It's where the Romans saw the whole city was a, a you've heard of uh, cat houses? Prostitute houses? The whole city was a city of prostitutes forced labor, forced sex slaves for the Roman soldiers. They could have anybody in town they wanted for their pleasure. She was trapped. Don't call her a harlot. But Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. No altar call. Romans 10, not... Oh. 9 and 10. 10, 9 and 10. Because her heart was changed. All that the person on the cross next to Jesus could say is, remember me. Mm-hmm. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't get all the cross. He, 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 he could, none of these people could go to the, the temple and get their sins forgiven. They weren't allowed. What's this guy supposed to do? Pull himself off the cross, walk here, come back, put himself back on the cross, go, yeah, I'm ready. No. God looks at your heart. He doesn't. It's not whether you know the right or wrong interpretation of Scripture. Do you know how to fulfill it? Oh. Do we pray but don't fulfill it? Oh. Is prayer just a works? Can be. It can be. But do you fulfill it? Are you willing to fulfill what somebody else is praying? Hmm. If it's within your ability, are you willing to fulfill what you're praying? Most of the time, not all the time, most of the time when someone has a burden on their heart, for a, a certain person or groups of people or something in a city, they're supposed to pray about that. And when they get done praying, they're supposed to get up and go do something about it. Mm-hmm. But that's where we miss it. Mm-hmm. I'm guilty. See, prayer is one of those things that will make you so self-conscious and or so guilty. You know what I mean by self-conscious? Everything's about you. Instead of Him? Are so guilty. In other words, you said you'd pray for an hour and you did 59 minutes. <laughs> and so you're not good enough. Or you said you're going to pray every day and you missed a day. Oh, I'm never good enough. See, that's all, all that's doing is bringing... Jesus would rather you pray two minutes, one minute from your heart and be quiet and listen and meditate on His Word the rest of the time. Than for you to have one of these long, beautiful. Now listen, listen. People that are good in relationships and communicators in relationship, boy, can they pray. 
people that aren't in the name of Jesus do it no <laughs> I mean, that's a, I mean, <laughs> some of us have real short but powerful prayer and some people have real long and glorious powerful prayers <laughs> so some of us put ourselves under guilt because we don't pray like that person prays you ever heard that one hey, you, I know you've never said that or keep track of all your Bible readings. In the times you... Well, I pray... See, when I say there's no power in prayer, it's the relationship that has the power. Mm-hmm. Working Holiness is not something you do. Holiness is God working through you. The ground was holy. Why? Not because Moses was standing on it, because God was speaking through it. God's presence was there. You're holy because God's presence is there. Jesus said, are you weary, tired, burnt out on religion? Come follow me. I'll give you a real rest. Take it easy. See how I do it. Learn from me. And how did he do it? He prayed. He fasted. He gave. He did all the things he's told us to do from his heart, not from a point of works. He was about his father's business. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for this opportunity you give us to be here tonight. Holy Spirit, you're the great teacher. We simply ask that you do what you do best. Open the eyes of our understanding. Bring to us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of who we are in you and who you are in us. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Can you, meet, you said salvation has seven Yep. I tell you what, that would be a good homework for you, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know, the, I'll just say it this way. Notice how I ask a question about that? She asked me a question. I, I did what? Ask her a question. A rabbi's job is not to answer people's questions. It's to ask another question to keep them thinking about God. See, pastors in America are supposed to know everything. No, my job is to ask a question in a way, when you ask a question, to keep you thinking about God and cause you to dig and study. Any more questions? No, (laughs) that I can answer with a question? (laughs) And again, I, I really don't think, I think we get discipleship backwards. We should have schooling on sonship and family heritage. And then talk about discipling. Because if you disciple yourself not knowing that you're a child of... See, the disciples were Old Covenant disciples. They were disciples under the Old Covenant. Disciples under the New Covenant are different types of disciples. The disciples weren't born again until after... They didn't believe Jesus was resurrected from the grave, did they? That's what I ask Bible school students all the time and they go cross-eyed. They go, when did the disciples get saved? And did they have to get saved twice? Whoa! Was there salvation on this side of Calvary? And was there salvation on this? They didn't have Romans 10, 9, and 10 over here. The blood hadn't been shed. What's Romans 10, 9, and 10 say? That God raised Him from the dead. God hadn't raised Him from the dead over here on this side of the cross. They didn't believe He was risen from the dead when He was risen from the dead. Oops. Yes. But doesn't it say in the Bible, didn't God say, bless those who believe without seeing? Absolutely. Absolutely. And where was that at? Um, I think Peter didn't believe. That's on this side of Calvary. Oh, oh, we're talking about that. Yeah, not over here. Thomas didn't believe. Amen? Oh, All right. Thomas. More questions, more comments, more input. Come on, we're just because I'm done doesn't mean I'm done. Or if anybody had a ding ding moment that they want to testify. <laughs> ding ding. Well, no, that's a, you know. Any that, revelation that, moment you yeah, mean? Just uh-huh. really aha uh-huh moment. A ding ding ding. Uh-huh. Ding, 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 <laughs> ding 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 ding. <laughs> no, I thought it was a blonde thing. Ding yeah. ding. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's your imagination you put toward the word that's important. Ding ding, if your bomb means. I'm like, oh. Ding 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 means. Oh, 
revelation, see? <laughs> any revelation, any input, any... It, please, I, I, my job is not to make you believe what I know is right, okay? My job is to make you think. Think about what you believe. It doesn't matter to me if you believe what I believe or not. It really doesn't. Because that's between you and the Holy Spirit. But I'm right. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Comments? Input? Come, it's good to see you again. It's been a long time. It's been a while. We were supposed to be there last night. Yes? Make sure you spell out loud yeah, enough. Thank you for your comments about prayer and the communing and waiting on Him. And, um, I heard Bill Johnson make a comment uh, a while back that he said, too often we let the enemy uh, determine the direction of a prayer meeting cool. because we often talk to God in reaction to what the enemy is doing rather than in response to what God is Thank you. Very good. That's very Isn't good. That yes, it is. And I've thought about that so many times. And that's usually in warfare. We experienced that personally for several years. We were part of a church that was, and they had paid intercessors and not a chief intercessors. And oh, give me a break. Chief or cheap? Chief. <laughs> they weren't cheap. Uh, and they had a. You had the head intercessor. And you had a second intercessor and a bunch of little intercessors. I was like, give me a break. Anyway. Anyway. And uh, they were so they were more moved about what Satan. All their warfare and all their prayer was about coming against what Satan was doing, instead of magnifying what Jesus has already done. And so, who's controlling the energy of the church if you're focused on what Satan's doing? And I'm going to add this because confession is one of those tools he was talking about. And really, what confession really is is aligning the frequency of my words to match the frequency of God's or something else. My words are going to agree with God or someone else. The devil. So who am I who am I agreeing with? Who and and the truth is frequencies will never stop. So the words that we speak out are still out there. All the words we've ever spoken they're still out there. So, am I choosing to align that frequency with Father or something else? You know, we need to understand the power of your words and frequencies. I, I usually, I don't have one with me. Um, I'll, I'll do this when it comes time. But if I told you that they have equipment that can go back into a room and... They can scan the wall and hear what you said after you've said it. Oh boy, they do. Now you think that's really strange, you know. Uh, but the, see, that's matter. That's a solid mass, and the frequencies get absorbed into that mass, and you're going, "That's so weird. That will never happen." And then I usually hope a little CD, a little round disc like this, that's full of frequencies. You know how that frequencies, that solid mass matter right here. You know how that frequencies are taken out of that mass matter? Light. Nothing touches it. Your little CD player is so advanced, it can reach into a piece of matter that something's been spoken into it and pull out what was spoken in the form of music or whatever teaching you're hearing, just like pulling out of the wall. Be careful what you say. It hangs around a long time. Your wow. words will judge you. What? You'll be judged by your words. Oh, man. Just interesting stuff, isn't it? Amen. We get into that. We talk about creationism, but we don't do that here. So, so I have a question back yes. on the friend of midnight. That, yes. That, that King James says because of the man's importunity. Yes. Which is... That's boldness. Holy boldness. Holy boldness. The boldness to ask right up to the edge of what's acceptable decor. I mean, so. And that holy boldness is inner, uh, is uh, that we can approach the throne of grace boldly. It's not our boldness in, I'm demanding from God. It's, oh, I'm confident, confident that yeah. God is going to do this for me yeah. or has done this for me. Well, because of the blood. Our yes. Boldness comes from That's the right. Blood. 
But I mean, then he goes into the next verse, ask and I, it'll be given. It doesn't say ask, 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 ask. It's just ask. Yeah. But the verse Knock. before does it say because of his boldness. His boldness. His confidence in God. Not his confidence in him or her. Yeah. His confidence in God that God's not like that, that evil friend. Right, right. That God's not like that. But because that confidence, you take that confidence to God, you know you, He's going to open the door and give you the food. Yeah, you don't he, have to keep... But He did ask and He kept on... And he yep, He did. Until he, and he was coming for His friend. Yep. It wasn't for Him, it was for His friend. And see, that guy wasn't even participating in the culture of the time at the time. Not To close his door and not give him food. God's not that way. Yeah. Is there a scripture though that says to ask and to keep on asking? Yep. But it's not saying begging God. It's that you just keep on until I mean, just keep on believing. Yeah. There, there's some people, you know, you believe until you receive, but you're not making God do something that He hasn't already done. God's already done it. If you're asking God to provide, oh God, I'm asking you, you're wasting your time. He's, he's, he's already answering you, saying, I already have. The scripture they use for asking, keep on asking, is that particular one. Yeah. But it says, ask. And you'll receive. Knock, and it'll be open. It's simple. Matter of fact, this whole passage of scripture right there is really how you think God responds to you is how you're going to respond to others. If you think God is conditional for you, you'll live a life of conditional with others. You'll make them conditional for you. How you treat most in heart physics, we get into this where it says how you think God is to you is how you're going to make people be to you. If you think God is unforgiving and keeping a list and checking it twice, you're going to treat everybody in your relationships that way. Man, that's, that'll hurt you right there. <laughs> if you feel God's forgiving you and loving you, you'll be a loving and forgiving person. Amen? Amen? Done.